How's that? Okay. Hi, I'm Rick. Um, I just wanted to say that we spend lots, of, most of BlinkOn, we spend talking about really cool, big, sexy stuff, all the really hard problems. And I just wanted to say that I think it's also important that we really focus on the on the small problems too. Uh, when I when I spend time talking to web developers, I've been talking a bunch lately with some external web developers and some some internal Google teams. I'm constantly amazed at how many of their pain points are actually just like this long list of fairly tractable problems. It's um, you know, just interop bugs or just plain old bugs that we've got or little perf issues that if, if we just put a bit more effort into really focusing on uh, product excellence, as we call it at Google, um, and, and just trying to, we can really make their lives a lot easier. And when you, when you ask developers and say, like, what is it you like better about, well, uh, when you hear developers say, oh, I really like working on native mobile platforms instead of the web, and you really drive into it and say, why? And they just give you these long lists of, oh, there's just this thing that drives me nuts, and this thing that drives me nuts, and just this thing that drives me nuts. So really quickly, I wanted to just highlight three little things that normally we wouldn't do a blink on talk about um, that are just relatively tractable problems that, uh, that we're working on in input dev to make developers' lives easier. So the first one is sometimes we just try to do too much. Sometimes we try to be too smart. Um, and this example is when we're navigating in Chrome, we restore the, the scroll position. So when you go backwards, we set the scroll position to where the user was previously, um, which is kind of a handy thing to do by default. Um, but it actually causes a lot of pain for a bunch of web developers that are trying to manage their own uh, uh, transitions between UI states themselves. I've seen a bunch of internal Google teams go to great lengths, relying on bugs that we've got where we don't restore the scroll state when it's an overflow scroll div, for example, um, to try to work around this. And then they have other bugs as a result. Um, and really, all they need is a little bool that just says, please don't turn this feature off. Um, so we're working with Mozilla right now on defining a really simple API that just lets you say, turn off this feature to restore scroll state. Another, thanks, Dr. Okay. Another one is some, sometimes there's just ways that we're different from other browsers and it's painful to fix, but we really should just all get on the same page. So I've, I'm sure people have seen the threads on Blink Dev. We've, We've been trying to be interoperable with respect to scroll top for a long time now. I traced this back to a KHTML bug that's 10 years old where someone said, you know what, I don't think what we're doing here scrolling on body is the right thing to do. <laughs> but no one actually took the time to try to make this interoperable. Um, and I think we've got a shot now of having a pragmatic way forward where we can move the web to an interoperable, uh, to, to where we're all, all the browsers are on the same page. We're at, we're at the state now where i.e. Edge is copying our bugs because that's the only way to make be compatible with the web, and it's just not okay. Every time some new developer learns how to build a website, they test it out on Chrome, and they, they scroll using body, and then they try it on Mozilla, and it doesn't work, and we, we just have to get on the same page. Um, and so this isn't sexy, it's not uh, particularly fun, but like this is the web. We should have this implement the same set of APIs. So, um, And the third one is sometimes there's just uh, surprising performance behavior that developers don't expect. So here's an example where, um, these are the bug numbers, by the way, if you want to see any more details, uh, where uh, a game, it's a, like a full screen game, has nothing to do with text selection, so they set this WebKit user select option to none on all of their elements to say don't allow to selection anywhere. And then they were surprised that when the user is dragging their mouse, they're spending like 30 milliseconds per frame on mouse move handlers, <laughs> what the heck's going on? And it's because on every mouse move, we're searching the entire DOM trying to find a candidate to select um, when they've all been disabled from selection. Um, and, and really, there's some, we can tell the developer, oh, just if you call prevent default on the mouse down, you're not gonna trigger selection, this whole problem goes away. But that's not good enough. We, developers can't get into this state in the first place. So the most immediate thing we're doing is we added tracing, so that hopefully it's a lot more obvious. You know, this developer actually did look at a trace and it was just completely opaque while we were spending so much time. Now it's a bit more obvious. Um, but really, I think the right thing to do here is, um, first of all, this is a prefixed API. IE's implementation of this API has, doesn't have this performance characteristic. Um, and so we're working on standardizing this API and the, the, uh, um, the way it's being standardized, the, the current spec, CSS spec, uh, will avoid this performance problem in the first place so people won't hit it. 
So I just wanted to encourage everyone, look at your bugs, triage your untriaged bugs. A lot of good stuff comes from web developers. And make sure you allocate time to fixing like these long tail of little annoying issues, because it really makes developers' lives a lot better. That's it. OK, thank you. So this is right. Yes. Back by popular demand. <laughs> I'm Daniel again. And it worked. Woo! Okay. Slightly different blobs. So these are my blobs. Um, blobs are really cool. I'm gonna do a really quick uh, intro to blobs. If you guys don't know, they're a web platform feature. You can shove stuff into them. It accepts anything: memory, files, other blobs offsets and sizes for other blobs and files. There's some examples there. A is all memory, B is a file, C is part of B and some memory and a file. It's basically a read-only storage for data. Really good for transporting stuff between browsing contexts because it's just, it, in the implementation, it's just a reference. All right, so why do they exist? As I said, read-only data. Um, saving files to a disk from JavaScript data. So if you're like uh, some application that's generating a bunch of data in JavaScript, you want to save it to a file, you put it in a blob, and that's how you save it to a file. Um, uh, it basically hands the, the memory to the browser, and the browser keeps it, and, it's, and it makes it really easy for data to be sent to various different systems in the browser. For example, IndexedDB, it's a really efficient way of sending stuff through navigator.connect because the memory doesn't actually move anywhere. It just stays in the browser. Um, so what's the problem? So we have somebody with a, a 3D printer web app. It can't save its files. Uh, 3D printer web app, think of SVG, but in three dimensions, so it's a big file. Uh, what's happening is that there's a global maximum. So there's just a hard-coded maximum in Chrome. Can't have any, anything more than 500 megabytes of blobs. This isn't great. Uh, and this is also cumulative and for the whole profile. Um, so there's lots of collateral damage that can happen. And also way too big for mobile. 500 megabytes, that's huge. Like you're saying, like a gigabyte on a phone is, is, is great. Uh, so what we're doing, we want to page to disk. So uh, this introduced a little bit more problems, but that's, that's our first solution. Um, Unfortunately, we have another problem that is, makes this bad. So we have synchronous transportation for large stuff. And what that means is on the renderer, when we send stuff to the browser, the renderer blocks for that data to be sent to the browser. Uh, you kind of can imagine what will happen here if we're sending stuff to disk. If we're sending lots of stuff to the browser and we're filling up our quota and we're waiting for stuff to be sent to disk, the renderer will just block on disk. Um, here's a drawing of that. So lots of stuff being sent from, from the renderers to the browser. Uh, we have a full memory cache. We're trying to save the disk. It's just blocked. One of the whole points of the renderer is that we don't want to block on disk. Um, so that's bad. We need to move to something different, and we need to move to an asynchronous protocol. Something like this would be great, um, where we, the browser can request data instead of it just getting thrown at the browser, and the also renderer can save stuff straight to files. Uh, here's a uh, quick... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read all of this to you guys. Um, just kidding. Uh, this is a quick description of the new asynchronous protocol, basically saying I want to send this stuff to the browser. Uh, the browser can, can ask for parts instead of having the memory sent at it right away. Um, and that's it. Any questions? <laughs> all right, questions <laughs> afterwards. Never mind. So Timothy's next is Daniel Chen. Right. So this is another uh, bug for Rick's list of like things that are not sexy, but also we should just fix them. Uh, this this was uh, posted internally uh, from some people doing web development at Google, and there are a lot of bugs because people get these mouse events that are synthesized from touch, and then they've already handled the touch events, and then they also try to handle the mouse events, and they do the uh, they handle the input twice. Um, and there are a couple different ways people try to get around this, where maybe they check, uh, does the onTouch event method exist? If so, listen to touch. Otherwise, listen to mouse, which is great until you have a touchscreen laptop which has both touch and mouse, um, and you run into problems there with the mouse just not working. And so we were aware of this years ago, and it's just been sitting on our plates for a while, but we're finally actually going to do something about it. Um, and the plan is we're going to give uh, UI event a source device attribute, which gives you uh, this input device object, which currently is just going to contain a Boolean 
uh, fires touch events. And so you'll be able to say, uh, does this mouse event come from a device which fires touch events? If so, then if I'm already handling the touch events, I don't care about this mouse event. This uh, input device object could also be used for a bunch of other cool stuff. If you want to be able to query like well, other attributes of the input device. So we're pretty excited that this is going to fix a longstanding bug and add an, a, uh, an API that will probably be useful for doing a bunch of other stuff in the future. So Daniel, so the next of Daniel is Itam. Yes. Uh, all right. Hi, I'm Daniel. Uh, so I've been working on out of process iframes for the last year and a half or so. I just wanted to give a quick status update of where we are. Um, since the last BlinkCon, we've implemented a lot of the stuff in the bindings and JavaScript stuff. So now you can actually have cross process window objects. Uh, you can window, well, you could window.open a, a frame in another process, but we had to revert that patch due to some other failures. Um, we'll reland it soon, I hope. Uh, you can post message across processes now, um, like between frames that are in different processes. And if you're if you have a load event on an iframe, if that iframe is actually being rendered remotely, we can bubble that load event up into the iframe element. Um, we've also done a bunch of stuff with origin and sandboxing flags, um, so we can answer certain JavaScript um, queries, you know, uh, synchronously. Uh, for example, if you are trying to find a window um, by looking it up by name. Uh, you need to be able to do that synchronously. Um, we're also working right now on switching to CC surfaces for rendering, um, which will help us resolve a bunch of other issues. Uh, we have a subteam now working on uh, Android, um, just making sure they actually work there. And also, we're also um, tracking down, trying to get performance numbers um, so we can actually see what the impact is. Um, so we're doing a lot of work trying to get the telemetry, um, get basically getting enough of Blink to work that we can run telemetry. Um, we're getting closer, but we're still not there yet. Um, there's still a lot of graphics and input issues. Um, uh, I'm sure the scrolling people love me. Um, so, um, and finally, kind of in this before next BlinkCon, we kind of want to get the input input stuff working. Right now, it's it's very inefficient. Um, you kind of have to go between multiple renders potentially, right? Because you hit test in the top level render, you're like, oh, this thing is actually in another process. So let me go over there and process the event there. And then that's like, oh, you actually, actually you're in another process. So go back over there, right? It's very inefficient. So um, along with the CC surfaces, um, we plan on being able to use the browser to kind of dispatch all these input events. So the browser will have to track focus. Um, all that sort of stuff, and you know, obviously, it's going to get quite hairy with scrolling, but hopefully, we'll get there. Um, and we're obviously working on. Uh, we want to work on better tests. Um, so, we've got a subset of the HTTP uh, layout tests working. Uh, we chose this because a lot of them test cross uh, cross origin stuff, and with our flag, all cross origin stuff is cross process right now. Um, and yeah, so hopefully. By this time next year, we'll be completely done. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so the next of Ethan is me. Okay. All right. Hi everyone. I'm Ethan. Uh, I'm here representing the Speed Infra team. Uh, and I just wanted to give you a quick introduction uh, to our team, uh, since we're a new team in Google, uh, talking, by talking about uh, what we like to call the performance lifecycle and how we can sort of help you manage that. Um, we've heard a lot here already about performance today. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's sort of a question of, of, you know, when do we become aware that, that Chrome has performance problems and what do we do about it? Um, so the first step uh, in this sort of performance li life cycle is what we like to call exploration. And what that means is um, we've sort of noticed that there are high level issues. And that could be um, you know, user reports. Uh, it, it's going to be something that's a, that's a general area. We don't know. We haven't traced it to a specific part of the code or anything like that. So the only thing 
the only way that we can kind of figure this out is by um, collecting high-level metrics and, and user reports and this sort of thing. Um, once we have sort of identified a problem area, uh, we can begin fixing it. And um, of course, we want to be able to fix it once and for all. And so uh, this is the sort of part uh, where you might sort of start building telemetry benchmarks or what have you to make sure that that doesn't happen again. When you notice functional issues with your code, uh, you fix the bug, and then you write a unit test to make sure that it never happens again. And we, you, know, you, you can sort of do the same thing here uh, using telemetry. Um, you can also use tools like TraceViewer, et cetera, to sort of help you drill down into your code and figure out exactly where the problems lie. Um, so once you've fixed it, you know, everything is good, but you want to make sure it stays good. Um, and so you use our monitoring tools. And telemetry continues to be a thing that you can use here. Um, telemetry in conjunction with the performance dashboard, uh, which I've been seeing screenshots of in people's talks all day, so that's pretty great, um, can help perf sheriffs do their job of catching regressions in whatever performance metrics you're interested in measuring uh, to make sure that you know your code that ensures that Chrome is going to continue to be fast will not break. Um, and inevitably, there are going to be issues. So you know, when there are act actual issues, luckily, since we've targeted an area of focus, um, we can have this kind of diagnosis and triage process. Um, and of course, the problem here is um, when your telemetry test doesn't catch the parts of the code that would need to be tested in order to you know, figure out where this failure is coming from. So uh, you're going to you know, figure out what the problem is and then modify your telemetry benchmark so that you can actually you know, catch this sort of regression in particular in the future. Um, and then finally, uh, outreach as uh, Rick was talking about, I mean, you know, many of these, these features that we all work on affect web developers, and so making them aware of specific ways in which you know, pathological problems in their code can cause performance problems in ways they didn't expect is really important, and so examples of, of how you can do this are you know, put your feature in DevTools, uh, make sure it's available in tracing so that people can see it in TraceViewer and so on. Um, so lastly, uh, I'd like to just uh, close with a note about Chrome scale tooling. So the mission of Speed Infra team is to provide uh, Chromium and Blink developers with the tools they need to measure uh, performance in a way that is easy, um, in a way that's sustainable. Um, and so uh, Nat Duca, who isn't here at this BlinkCon, but as many of you know, um, wrote a great sort of piece uh, that I'm going to link to after this slide uh, about what he calls Chrome scale tooling. So the idea is Chromium is a big enough project that we need to be really be focused on, on building tools that uh, aren't just going to rot over time, right? Um, because as my coworker likes to say, um, if you're not measuring something, you don't care about it. Um, okay, so finally, uh, so there's the link to Chrome scale tooling, bit.ly Chrome scale tooling. I encourage you to read that piece. Uh, we have two mailing lists that are public right now, uh, telemetry at and tracing at. Uh, please use those for any questions that you might have about telemetry. Uh, or tracing, those are generally pretty active. Um, and then I'd like to just point out my team members who are here, uh, myself, and if the rest of you could stand up or wave, yeah. Uh, we've got Kari, Dave, Oystein, and Ryan. Um, and then finally, I'd like to advertise our breakout session tomorrow, 10 a.m. Uh, in Barangaroo. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the state of the art of speed infra and telemetry, so thanks so much. So the next one is mine, and the next person of me is Stefan Cheni. Okay, so I want to do the binding team update. So the team goal is to make V8 Blink bindings more conformant with the spec and easier to use and faster. So this talk is a three minute summary of what we have accomplished in the past six months. The first one is moving DOM attributes, and now almost all DOM attributes are on prototype chains, and the JavaScript getters and the setters are exposed on DOM attributes. So yes. <laughs> so finally, web developers can override the default behavior of DOM attributes, yes. And we shipped the feature in M43, but haven't yet observed any serious compatibility issues so far. And the good news is that WebKit also moved DOM attributes to prototype chains recently, uh, which means that all browsers now have DOM attributes on prototype chains. 
So next one is ideal conformance. So we supported new ideal features, including ideal dictionary, ideal union type, ideal serializer, ideal iterator, and ideal set like, map like. So we are adding support upon request. So if you need some new ideal features, please just ping us. And the third one is making VAT APIs multi-thread aware. So the problem is that if the main thread sends a termination signal to a worker thread that is executing a VAT API, so this can happen asynchronously. So in this case, the VAT API can return an empty handle. So however, VAT bindings have assumed that most VAT APIs don't return an empty handle. So what happened? So as a service worker gets more adopted in the wild, we get more and more crashes. So we are rewriting a ton of call sites of V8 APIs in V8 bindings, Gene, and Chrome extensions. So this is not fun, but very important work and we are doing. And the final one is core modules componentization. So the goal is to make core and modules separately linkable. So the status is uh, we are 98% complete. And given that the current core module ratio is five to two, uh, this means that the core module componentization will speed up a link time by 30%. Yes. So as a next step, uh, we are going to start Brink componentization V1, uh, which are going to fix the broken dependencies in Brink. And also we want to make the interaction between Brink and Chromium simpler and faster. So I'm going to have a session tomorrow, so please come if you are interested in. So thank you. Okay, so Stefan. Okay, so I'm unslided and this is very half baked. Uh, so when I look at data uh, numerical types, we start with ints, we go to layout units, we go back to ints, we go to skier, we use ints, then we render at some zoom and we go to floating point and don't know where anything ends up. Um, it seems ridiculous. What I would like to propose somewhere down the line is that we move everything to layout units, we re enable the SK scalar fixed point pipeline in Blink, and we let Blink make the decisions about where we draw boundaries on integers, uh, where we align things on integer boundaries for rasterization. Um, there's a couple of gotchas here. One, uh, a lot of JavaScript APIs expect integers back, so we need somewhere dealing with that. Um, and also, um, potentially, how to deal with issues like these table cells should all be the same width. Uh, that kind of information might get lost by the time it gets to Skia. Um, but I think also, and. Uh, the other reason, the other thing motivating this is that we spend a lot of time, it's not infrequent that uh, top um, profile uh, call sites are things like layout unit conversions to integers or to floats. And there's no really no reason why we should be doing those. Um, so there's no, one from, there's no one from the skier team here to say this is a stupid idea. Um, and, in, <laughs> and in particular, they're the people, that, that team would have to do a lot of work. They actually deprecated their fixed point pipeline and I would have to ask them to bring it back again. Um, so. That's, that's probably the biggest uh, impediment to doing this right now, as well as getting everything to layout units. But the layout team's doing that for me. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. If you're interested in talking about this, then I'll be around tomorrow for sure to talk about it. So the next one is Ojan, and the next Ojan is Kento-san. Hello. Um, as many of you know, about six months ago, a handful of us went off and did an experiment called Sky which um, I'm not gonna go into detail about here, but it was basically an experiment at uh, rethinking the web platform in a layered way, being very mobile focused. Um, that experiment is still ongoing, but a couple of us are now back on Blink, having learned a bunch of things from Sky, and I wanted to share some of the things that I've learned. Um, particularly, uh, the strongest thing I come back to Blink feeling is that we're drowning in complexity. Um, our, our code base is extremely complicated and I've seen the promised land of what it looks like to have like a simpler layered code base. Uh, and out of that comes both performance in a very direct way because the core code is doing less, but in an indirect way because you can reason about the code better and thus make it faster. Um, so I think much of the complexity in Blink uh, is fundamental to the web platform. It's just a complicated like beast that's evolved over many years. Uh, the thing that surprised me as we tore our fork of Blink down and made it smaller and simpler was 
a lot of the complexity actually has nothing to do with the web platform. It just has to do with like 20, 30 year old code that is that has evolved over time and no one has like really taken a hacksaw to it and made it better. Um, so coming back to Blink, I'm, I'm very excited about us reducing complexity. Um, and actually, so I have two lightning talks back to back. Um, that was the first one is uh, <laughs> what we learned from Sky. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to talk with people more about that stuff for what it's worth. Uh, the other one is uh, a more specific proposal aimed at reducing complexity, which is um, last week I started chatting with people about the idea of, I mean, as a team, we're, we're all fairly bought in to the idea that we should be implementing a layered platform. I think that's, that there's almost universal agreement among us that that's valuable and we should build new features on top of primitives and let's focus on exposing primitives to web authors. Um, I'm very interested in making it so that we can make that a reality today that any new high level features we add, we implement on top of primitives. So one proposal that I'm exploring at the moment um, and that I'd love help with is uh, taking the Blink uh, web IDL files, so the same APIs we expose to JavaScript and exposing them to our C++ code. Um, so then when we go to implement high-level features like the, the canonical one that we've been using is snap points, um, we implement it on top of primitives that we'd like to expose someday. Uh, we don't necessarily have all the primitives today because you need something for like interacting with the compositor and you need something for knowing when layouts have happened and when things get on screen and that sort of thing. Um, but if we build them today in a layered way in the C++ code, where the only thing we have access to is either exposed APIs or APIs we intend to expose in the future, uh, we can work towards that layered future and keep our code base both simple and fast. Oh. One last thing. Uh, if you're a Googler, you can see my beginnings of a proposal at Go Layered Platform. If you're not a Googler, you can ping me and I'll send you the doc. Uh, OK, uh, I talk about something. OK. Um, <laughs> soon we are going to merge repository. You know, uh, probably it's true. Uh, so we need to decide uh, uh, about our coding style. You know, uh, using two different coding style in one repository is uh, very messy. We have uh, multiple choices, I think. Uh, one, first one is uh, do nothing. We keep two coding style, and we keep our current uh, Blink coding style uh, as is. The second choice is uh, um, uh, uh, remove uh, being trivial being coding style and keep uh, important things. For example, I don't like 80 column limits in Chromium, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so uh, also, um, it's very uh, difficult to uh, change coding style, for example, uh, naming rules such as uh, M underscore something, or, and, and also we, we want to keep, keep a web idea naming rule and so uh, bring style no, compatibility. Uh, so, we might want to keep a uh, current naming rule. The next choice is uh, completely uh, through our building coding style and just use a uh, Chromium style. Another choice is uh, use Blink style in Chromium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Anyway, uh, uh, we need to decide this uh, after Chromium much. That's it. So, Mike. Oh, 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 click on it. All right. So, 
Uh, I named my talk Abusing Flexbox to Relive the 90s. Um, my other title was going to be Vertical Centering because vertical centering on the web, as anyone who's done any web development in the past 15 years knows, is just one of those things that you think how hard could it possibly be? And it wasn't until Flexbox came out that they showed us exactly how hard it was. And so um, I wanted to uh, play, play with this awesome newfound power uh, and relive my graphics geek days uh, back from the 90s. And one other thing uh, that uses vertical centering or could actually use vertical centering uh, is Wolfenstein 3D. So I, um, in, in, a, in a fit of uh, uh, vector rendering enthusiasm, built a Wolfenstein 3D style engine that is rendered using Flexbox. So the way this works is that each one of these strips, as it, each one of these strips is just, it's a whole column of flex boxes and each of these strips is centered vertically. So the code was actually really simple. All I had to do was trace rays out to figure out how far the, wa the wall was away and then just set the, the height of the flex box uh, thing in the middle and all the magic just kicked in and it worked. The other thing that freaks people out is the actual frame rate here. It is actually running at 60 frames a second. Uh, and that, that seems to, apart from all the vector math that goes behind doing this, that's the thing that surprises people the most is that not only does it work, but it actually seems to work performantly. And how the heck is that actually possible? Well, it seems like it is. Uh, and I was quite, quite burned quite, quite a couple of hours just walking around in my little world. Uh, and I was really happy that I could relive all those graphics tricks back that I learned that I learned back in the 90s. So there you go. That's my youth in Flexbox. So this is the last talk, but we have 20 minutes. So if you want to give live talks, please stand in line. Uh, so, uh, this is Takayoshi Coach uh, from Tokyo office. Uh, I'm working on Shadow DOM and Web Components project. And uh, uh, Shadow DOM was uh, only implemented in Blink, as you know. But uh, now other browser vendors are catching up, and especially Mozilla is already implementing Shadow DOM. And last month, we had a big step forward about uh, Shadow uh, Web Components. Uh, all browser, major browser vendors, including Apple, Microsoft, and uh, Mozilla, uh, came, came together in San Francisco, and we discussed the Shadow DOM V1, uh, which is a com common uh, baseline spec for the Shadow DOM. And we agreed on the V1 spec, al almost agreed on the <laughs> V1 spec. So uh, hopefully uh, other vendors will catch up the implementation in near future, so we, we don't need any polyfills for, for example, for poly polymer project and so on. And, and so uh, we will have more detailed update or if you have anything about Shadow DOM or web components, uh, we will have a breakout session tomorrow, 3.45 p.m. Uh, you can see on the, on the whiteboard. So please come to the uh, dream time at 3.45 if you have any interest. And so uh, this is the Shadow DOM V1 bug on, on the W3C. So this is discussed in uh, public web apps and so on, uh, other W3C mailing list. So and he, here's a demo uh, that some, uh, of something that I'm recently working on. Uh, can you see this? Okay. Uh, so usually, if you uh, if any web developer has has to control the uh, 
フォーカスビリティをタブ、タバビリティ、I mean, the, if, if you hit tab, then フォーカス moves around that. If you want to control, then you, ha you have to add tab index attribute on the element. So, then if you have a shadow DOM component using shadow DOM and custom elements, then uh, some, something is uh, going to be screwed up. This is a demo, and uh, this is a stable version. So, I, I, uh, I am a web developer, and I created a cool date input element by using shadow DOM. So the second one, date input, is my own element. And mimic, uh, mimicking the original input type equal date. So let me type uh, tab key, then goes to the mm field in the date input. So it works perfectly So in the shadow DOM. And tab, tab again, and tab again goes to move, to move the uh, focus. So it is all, almost compatible with uh, the original uh, one. Uh, this is running in Japanese locale, so uh, Japanese uh, year, month, date is displayed. But to me, the, these are these look identical. Okay. So let me see. Yeah, it it, it works. So, but once if you control the order of the tabbing, you have to add tab index. Like this. Okay, so I added tab index one, two, three. I, I hope this this goes one, two, three by hitting tab. But actually, let me see what what happens so now uh, focus is this input element then i hit tab then the focus is now uh, the date input element itself not in the uh, mm field so you have to hit extra one tab key uh, because the tab stops at the shadow host itself and not, not in the uh, focusable element because shadow host became a uh, focusable by adding tab index attribute so this is uh, the kind of defect of shadow dom so not not in implemented uh, in the past so here here's the uh, new one the chromium uh, self built chromium or you can use canary to and you can enable this feature by uh, enabling uh, web experimental web platform features via Chrome flags. I, I think uh, everyone in this room already enabled that flag. Uh, so let me hit tab here and okay, okay. So it it no 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 it is not working perfectly because. <laughs> Uh, you, you see the uh, fo focus, focus ring around the data input, and MM is also, uh, 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 <laughs> oh, there's still bugs, but I'm fixing it, okay. <laughs> so the, the magic is that, uh, oh, let, now uh, we have added uh, new uh, attribute tab stop tab st by giving tab stop attribute or by giving tab stop uh, property from JavaScript to DOM object, then you can uh, skip tabbing uh, from the uh, uh, for the shadow host, and then you can uh, completely uh, write your own version of. Uh, date input element. So that's what I'm uh, working. So and uh, I will uh, upstream th this spec uh, if if this implementation complete and to the shadow DOM uh, spec or HTML spec in the future. Thanks. So we have 13 minutes. So if you want to give live talks, please stand in line. So your hand. Hi. Um, I just want to give a quick update on on the Blink merge. Um, 
So the current status is that we have seven seconds. Oh no. Uh, okay. So the current status is that we're buying hardware. Um, it's a surprising number of machines that you need to actually um, run the commit queue. Um, if everything goes by plan, by end of May, we will have all the hardware and it's going to be in the data center and imaged and hooked up to the respective masters. Then the next step would be that, so you might have noticed that 10%, roughly 10% of the commit queue jobs from Plink actually already run all the testers from Chromium, um, which then run layout tests as well. And so once we have all the hardware, we will go to 100%, um, assuming nothing explodes and melts down. Um, then we'll just do the merge. So if, if you want to prepare for what the merged world will look like on the Chromium FYI waterfall, there's um, uh, a build on the tester called Chromium Practice and Chromium Practice Tester that um, already use a merged repository. So in Chromium source, uh, Chromium Google source.com, there's already a merged repository, so you can look at what it looks like. Um, the actual biggest change is um, about pixel results for layout tests. Um, so to keep the merge kind of manageable in size, we will prune the history of pixel results. Um, you can still see the history of the tests and the text results, but just not the pixel results. And so what happens to commits that had previous pixel results, those will just not have pixel results in them, right? So like if, if you look at a single PNG file, it'll be just in the last commit that modified that PNG file. Um, so that's kind of like the interest, most interesting difference. Um, if anybody of you has some kind of tools that work on top of um, Blink, you might want to test it on, on that repository um, because it's largely a self-service merge kind of. Like we, we merge the repository, you fix your tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Mustak from Google Waterloo. Uh, it's a quick update on Pointer events. So many of you already know, like we decided to support Pointer event and developer community is very happy about our change position in this regard. Uh, I'm, I'm working on implementing Pointer events and we already landed the, uh, like the types, the types, the, the Pointer event type is already available. And Hopefully, we'll be start. We'll start firing point events for touch only by the end of this quarter. So yeah, that's why where, where is ten now. So in case you have some comments or you what we are looking for some someone to yell at, you know how to do that. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to come up really quickly and say a couple of things about um, a bullet point which was listed on the slide this morning that some people might have heard of or might not have. might be interesting to know about it uh, as it will probably start coming up a little in the future. Um, so there was a bullet point you might have noticed this morning uh, in the opening uh, presentation that, that said uh, site, engagement, site engagement score slash karma. Um, so I imagine most of you don't know what that's referring to. Uh, so it's kind of as the name would describe. The idea is uh, what if uh, we could basically give a score to each website for each user to say how much the user engages with that website and then use that score to decide how we allocate resources. For example, the amount of storage a website is able to consume on the user's machine uh, or the eviction order for the storage. Um, and in particular, the, some of the Tokyo folk are working on uh, the background sync API, which will allow websites to kind of run periodically in the background. And it would be nice if we could use this score to say, if the user visits this site frequently and engages with it a lot, it can run more frequently in the background. If they engage with it less, it runs less frequently in the background. So uh, that's just an interesting thing to know about. Um, we're hoping to have it working at some point in the future. Um, so if you have any thoughts about how it could be useful or what we might apply it to, then come and chat to me and I'll point you in the right direction. So any other one? 
Okay, so I want to give one talk. So this is related to the coding style uh, Kento Sam mentioned, but I want to have more comments in the code base. So Green code base is very hard to understand sometimes because of the uh, lot of implicit knowledge is there and lack of comments. So two months ago, I was investigating a partition alloc, and it was very hard to understand how it's working. So after understanding how it's working, I landed a bunch of comment-only changes uh, to add comments. And I did the same thing for oil pan and bindings and so on. So if you don't understand the code, it means that a person who will read the code in the future won't understand the code. So I want to have more, code, uh, more, more comments in the code base. So any other one? Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much.